Welcome back to Black News Tonight. The literary world has lost a huge voice in the culture. Author and hip-hop critic Greg Tate has passed away in New York City. Tate, known for his work, his pioneering work, really, at The Village Voice, was able to provide a view that allowed readers to feel his perspectives and the perspective of black people, black lives, black culture, inside and out. In 1992, Tate published his first book. It was called Fly Boy in the Buttermilk a collection of essays that would serve as what he called a little something of a toolkit for generations to come. In 2003, author Ricky Vincent wrote, quote, Tate foreshadowed the era of the funky black intellectual, the African-American scholar who could get down and dirty with the discourse about black folks in their natural habitat, if you will. Tate's style and voice was impossible to mimic, and his influence is insurmountable. Joining me tonight to talk more about the life and legacy of the godfather of hip-hop journalism is Duke University professor Dr. Mark Anthony Neal. Good to see you, my brother. I, I don't even know where to start, man. When I got the news, uh, I got a text from Teray actually earlier today, and he said that uh, that Greg Tate had passed away, and I, I was I was shocked. I immediately texted you and a couple other folk because I, I just couldn't believe uh, what I had heard. Um, and the first thing that I noticed was the number of people who I consider to be giants who were not only mourning his loss, but talking about how influential he was in their lives. You, to Joan Morgan, to Quest Love, to, I mean, to, to Nelson George. I mean, you could go across the, across the board. Michael Eric Dyson, it, it was absolutely stunning. So I guess for the audience that doesn't know his work, can we just talk, start by just talking about who was Greg Tate and why is he so important to the culture? You know, he was born in Ohio, his family moved to D.C. when he was 13, came up in D.C., went to Howard University, and he got to New York in 1982 and started freelancing. Um, he's one of, the, one of the founding members of the Black Rock Coalition, among his other, you know, successes and, and achievements. But the biggest thing was that he started writing at the Village Voice, right? And this is the time when black journalism was kind of wide open. The Village Voice was a newspaper that you could pick up for free, you didn't have to buy. And somehow, because of its advertising structure, it had all these amazing writers. So you could read Lisa Jones in the Village Voice, you could read Joan Morgan eventually in the Village Voice, Nelson George, and of course, Greg Tate. And, and he cut his teeth doing a form of black cultural criticism that we had never really seen before. Part of it was that he was so well read across so many genres of writing. So this is someone who was as deeply immersed in the music of Miles Davis and say James Brown as he was post-structuralist theory, right? So he's reading Baudrillard, right? He's reading Edward, uh, you know, Said. Um, he's reading Henry Louis Gates, introducing popular post-structuralism to cultural criticism in ways that we, ever, we hadn't seen before. And his creative use of language and words, there was some, nothing like that. You know, so many people talked on social media today about, you know, reading Greg Tate and trying to mimic his style. Man, I've been mimicking, trying mm -hmm. to mimic his style for 30 years. Um, and, and it was just something that was so unique and fresh um, and, it, you know, as someone else said, he brought everybody into the room. Um, and, and that was the legacy of Greg Tate. Now, absolutely. You know, when I introduced the segment, I talked about him as hip hop journalism. But as you said, hip hop couldn't contain him. He was he was much bigger than that. I mean, he's, he's somebody, as you said, that's in a tradition of so many people. One of my favorite uh, pieces of writing of his was when he was comparing or analyzing Public Enemy and explaining <laughs> why Public Enemy had the same cultural impact uh, as the Beatles. And he, he did it in this way that was so refreshing and brilliant. And he, he made you feel like your culture mattered. He made you feel like the stuff that our grandmamas created and that our uncles created and that our cousins was listening to on the radio station uh, and on the record players, that all of that stuff was just as significant. And he brought a level of intellectual heft that allowed us to really, not to, to make sense of it, but also to bring it to this broader world. But but he wasn't doing it just to please that broader world. It wasn't like he was just writing so white folk would appreciate black folk. He actually was... He, yeah. he was doing something far more sophisticated and ahead of his time than that. And, and he wasn't afraid to call a spade a spade, right? When he thought, you know, as he would describe it, some artists were doing things whack, he would call them out. His obituary of Miles Davis, you know, an artist that he loved that was in mm -hmm. high esteem... But when he writes in that obituary that Miles Davis went out like a roach 
talking specifically about Miles Davis's gender politics, you know, there wasn't a moment where there were a lot of mainstream black critics, you know, had a feminist lens in terms of the work that they were doing. And that's something that Greg, I think, brought organically. I mean, part of that was the influence of, you know, his very, very powerful and influential mother, you know, Florence Tate, you know, who was press secretary to Jesse Jackson when he was making those great runs. And, you know, and so he came out of this family with his father, his, his brother, Brian, um, all these uh, amazing voices, and he heard all those voices and tried to present them into a world in a fair and balanced way, but but always with a kind of uh, swag, you know, just a swag that was just, you know, recognizable. You would always know a Greg Tate line as soon as you read it. Man, that's so true. One of the things I, I think people don't appreciate about Greg Tate is how he modeled or even prefigured uh, the current identity of the black public intellectual. You know, as the 90s were coming in and, you know, I was still, I, I was, you know, trying to figure this thing. I was just reading books and hoping to be like y'all, you know, and y'all, when I say y'all, I mean people like you, Mike Larrick Dyson, Joan Morgan, and y'all were following this template that Greg Tate had created. Mm -hmm. You know, I think what made him special was the fact that he, he modeled a kind of intellectual adventurousness. And, and you alluded mm -hmm. to it earlier, you know, mm -hmm. he wasn't afraid to read across genres and disciplines, as you pointed out, but he also was willing to dabble in art. He was dabbling all, all sorts of visual culture. He was willing to dab into theater. He was willing to dabble into music, movies, whatever it was. He consumed all of it and put them in conversation with each other. And then also, which made him just the coolest dude alive to me. He was also a practitioner of that stuff. Greg was like, you know what? I'm going I'm to I'm start a band. I'm going to perform jazz. I'm going to do this sugar. thing. I'm not yeah, just going to watch it and write about it. I'm, I'm going to do it. I, I have so many different stories. Of, you know, there's a time when he was performing down here in Dorm with Bird Sugar. And I happened to be in the music store mm. with my daughters when they were very young, picking up stuff for their violins. Um, and it's like he's just there with the crew buying, you know, stuff that they needed for their performance at night. Um, and, and he was so gracious with his time that day with my daughters. But everyone who's had contact with Greg will talk about just how gracious he was and gave that he was generous, that he was with his time and his energy. Um, when you talk about him being, uh, you know, thinking a wide array of things that he was interested in, you know, he would show up at academic conferences, you know, he would show up at symposia, you know, places where you weren't expecting necessarily to see Greg Tate, but he would be there and vibe and contribute in a way, even if he wasn't the person who was speaking you know, up on the panel or anything like that. Um, I don't know of any real cultural, black cultural figure like Greg Tate that in some ways existed before he did and exists now. The, the, it, it was like, it's like, it, he was like Stanley Crouch, but like a lot nicer. <laughs> 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 that's a, that's a really good way. <laughs> that's a great way to put it. Um, you know, the thing, you know, the thing I loved about Greg also, you know, he was an artist, right? As you mentioned, and, and the writing was art yeah. also, you know, his classic essay, you know, cult knack needs to freaky deek is really a challenge for black critics and black journalists to do modes of criticism that was as stylish and as sophisticated as the art that they were critiquing. Um, you know, that's something that I've been trying to do my whole career that many of us have been trying to do our whole career to elevate the art of criticism. And, and you know, in this era of, you know, Twitter shade and, and, and Internet shade where, you know, everybody tries to get their digs in in 240 words, you know, Greg was committed to a different kind of expressive art around criticism. And this is the thing. If you follow Greg Tate on Facebook, no one did Facebook like Greg Tate. He elevated the use of social media as a form of micro criticism um, that was just amazing. Um, and his presence there, the way that he could weigh in on so many things, um, it, it's such a loss, right? But again, there's so much work for us to unpack. There's a generation of folks who didn't grow up reading the Village Voice. Um, so many of his essays that were collected in Flyboy and the Buttermilk and then Flyboy 2, which Duke University published in 2016. There's an incredible legacy for us to go back and look at and build upon. And Greg would want us to build upon that legacy. Absolutely. I, mean, I think about the last time I saw uh, Greg Tate, I was in, um, where was I? I was actually last two times I sent One time I was in Brooklyn. Uh, I was just <laughs> leaving my, my place in New York and walking down the street and he was just 
he was just he was just leaving um this art exhibit right in downtown Brooklyn, right in Fort Greene. And he was surrounded by people, but blending in, right? And he, it was just some, I wish I could cuss, but just the flyest issue you would have seen, man, him just coming down the street, <laughs> leaving his art exhibit, smooth clothes on, looking like a jazz With musician, his scarves on, just right? real dope, man. <laughs> always the scarves, man, always the scarves. And then the last time I saw him was actually in the, vill in the village now, ironically, and I, and I wish I had stopped to speak to him because... He was in there and he was holding court and it was clear that he was breaking down something <laughs> so that it would, you know, be, as they say, continuously forever be broken. And we just waved and nodded at each other, man. And like you said, he would just pop up with his art exhibit, whether it was the cafe. I did an event at the Lincoln Center 15 years ago, didn't know Greg Tate would know who I was. And, I, and maybe he didn't at that time. <laughs> But when I saw him in the crowd, I was like, yo, I'm in the right place. I don't know if I, what I said made right, sense, but the right, fact that he right. was there made me know I was in the right place. And and that's that's just how he was. That's just who he was, man. And so I, I know a lot of people out there don't know who Greg Tate is, uh, who, who are in our world. But, man, he, he, we just don't have black cultural criticism in this generation. We don't have hip-hop journalism. Yeah. We don't right. have right. jazz criticism of this generation. We don't have popular writing. We don't have this black public intellectual. We don't have... Uh, Greg Tate. In fact, I, I laughed. I saw on Twitter, Monty Perry was talking about the great scholar at Princeton uh, said that Greg Tate once said to her, you know, I'm thinking about getting a PhD. And she said, for what? So you can go and re and study with a bunch of people who are citing your work already. Your work. You know, I mean, that, that's who he was. Yeah. Um, you, you know, the, to think about, you know, someone like Greg Tate and, and the fact that he was so willing to give shine you know, when he could. And as you mentioned, you know, when I was a young scholar, graduate student, I remember going up to New York when I was home and, and literally trying to stalk him at the Village Voice. Going up there, it's like, is Greg Tate, is Greg Tate around? Because, you know, you couldn't tweet anybody, right? You, you couldn't send right, anybody right, an email. Right. Maybe you could send a phone call. And of course, Greg famously was never actually at the Voice, right? And, you know, at his desk, uh, but it was on right. that level. And, and, you know, we're so invested now in being the people with the shine that we're not training enough people to write in a way that provides shine for other people. That in and of itself is an art form, right? And, and even folks who deserve shine understand what it means to do critical work. Baraka did critical work. The fact that Ellison took the time to review Leroy Jones's blues people when he was Ralph Ellison. Right. But he was committed to the culture and the right. work and wanted to advance the work. And that critical work is how you advance the work. I knew who Skip Gates was because I read Greg Tate. I knew what post-structuralism was because I read Greg Tate. Right. And, and yeah, I found out more about Miles and Michael Jackson, and all these other kind of folks. But it was a commitment to the culture. And, and the thing that we can always leave in terms of Greg's legacy, you know, Greg Tate loved us. <laughs> And he loved the culture, mm. right? And to his dying day, he was committed to continuing to give what he could to us and the culture that we all represent. That's it, man. And when you say those names like Ellison and Baraka, Crouch, Greg Tate's right. name belongs right there with them. And, and while his, his life has ended more quickly than we would have thought and more quickly than we would have loved to see, we give thanks for him. And in 1991, he wrote these lasting words. I realize that the meaning of being black is summed up in who comes to bury you, who gathers together in your name after you've gone, what they have to say about who you loved and how you were loved in return. You were loved, big brother. Everybody, thank you for watching Black News tonight. We'll see you later. Peace.